The Bible bus has crossed over Jordan, and we're on our way into the promised land. So why don't you hop aboard as we continue our exciting journey through the book of Joshua. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, well, he's going to take us to the fourth chapter of the book of Joshua, beginning in verse 9. But before we get started, we want to take a minute and catch up with our world prayer team. They're traveling through Western Africa this week. So joining us now is my friend Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president. It's great to be here, Steve, and it's great to be traveling along with our world prayer team as we pray through Western Africa. So many countries, more than 50 countries in the continent of Africa, so many different cultures, so many different challenges. But in Ghana, we are praying today for the effectiveness of Through the Bible in the language of Twi. Okay, Twi. That's yes, an interesting that's language. That's an interesting language, a very major, important language. And what's interesting about Ghana is about 60% of Ghanaians say that they're Christians, yet often that's in name only. Gee, we never have seen that in our country, have we? Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, the cliche that I've heard about Africa is Christianity is a mile wide and an inch deep. It often can be, and often African churches struggle with the mixing of Christianity yeah. with other faiths and practices, often called syncretism. You see it in other places like Latin America. Is very common. And currently, Islam has an aggressive outreach in Ghana. And so we want to be encouraged by how God is moving, but we also want to pray for those who listen to Through the Bible to recognize the truth. And there are some great testimonies. Here's the first one. I've learned from today's lesson that we should not delight in the things of this world. Our obsession with worldly things hinders our relationship with God. I hope that as we listen, we obey what God commands us to do. And Dr. McGee would say that's the rubber meeting the road right yep. there. That's that's real teaching about real life. I love it when we get that kind of feedback that the listeners are really grappling with real issues in their lives. Yeah. Now, here's one. Uh, I've noticed that some of us Christians are afraid of witchcraft. I used to be a victim, but the Through the Bible radio program made me realize that the power of God supersedes every other power. Amen. Wow. Good, good statement. This uh, response goes on. All we need is to walk uprightly in him, and no matter the temptation the devil brings to us, God will deliver us from them all. Hmm. What a great reminder. Yes. Here's another one. I used to complain a lot about the hardships of life, but through the Bible's teaching about how Joshua led the Israelites to obey God by going round the walls of Jericho seven times, I have stopped this habit. I rather give thanks to God in all situations, as Apostle Paul admonishes us to do. I am truly grateful for this program. And I love the fact that in this one testimony, she's quoting, or he, we don't know actually if it's a man Mm -hmm. or a woman, is from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes. And they're getting the whole Word of God. Yes. That is great evidence that, that God is at work. And now, I think we have just enough time for me to tell you another very exciting thing that is happening in this language is there's a, a very well-listened-to FM station. And this man, what he does is he's like the morning disc jockey, and he's apparently he's very uh, vivacious, okay. <laughs> very personable. And he will play the Through the Bible program, and then for hours he will bring up parts of it and have people calling in and talking, and they're getting huge response wow. from that because he's actually engaging the listeners. So I just think it's great for all of our listening family to know that there are so many creative things that are being done with Through the Bible around the world, and it's it's exciting. Yeah, it is wonderful. Greg, let me pray for us as we begin the program. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and so encouraged for the way the ministry is moving in Ghana. I pray, Lord, for those Christians that maybe don't have a deep relationship with you, that they would listen to the program, that they would um, be focused on the Word of God, and that you would reveal yourself to them in ways that they had never seen before through Scripture. Would you continue to bless the ministry as it goes out in Ghana, as well as in the U.S. and around the world? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, as we come back here to the fourth chapter, we saw last time two things that were very impressive indeed. And that was that the ark, first of all, went down into the Jordan River. That ark speaks of Christ. And the people passed over because of the ark. It's not the rod of Moses or the rod of Aaron or anyone else's rod now. And the people passed over. And when they did, before the ark came out, this man Joshua did something that's very meaningful for us today, and it became 
meaningful for them, of course. They took out 12 stones out of the Jordan, the bed of the Jordan River. They took them to the West Bank and they put them up as a memorial that the coming generations might know what had happened. Then they took 12 stones that were on the bank and put them down in the water. Now, the 12 stones that they put down in the water speak actually of the death of Christ. The unseen stones, God sees these, we reckon on them. And they speak of the law, but the law you and I could not keep in the waters of death. The law brought death. It was a ministration of death. But Christ is born, that judgment death for you and me on the cross. Now he has come forth in newness of life. And those stones that came forth, they speak of God's power and the grace of God. For Christ is at the right hand of God today, and we come to him. Now it is by this that you and I are enabled to enter today into Canaan, that is, into the heavenlies, and to live for God in these days in which we live. Now we have here that stated in Romans. This is a great truth for us. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. That is, when we came by faith and trusted him, we were identified. We were put into the body of Christ. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, by identification into death. When he died, we died that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, the only way you can go in and possess spiritual blessings, Paul made it clear in Ephesians. He says, he beseech, it's not a command, but he says, I beseech you as the prisoner of the Lord that you walk worthy of the high calling by which you're called. And today... That is a noble walk. It's to walk in the unity of the Spirit. Now, when a child of God does this, meets God's demands, then these great spiritual blessings are ours today. But the crossing of the Jordan is not the death of the believer. We don't stand on Jordan's stormy banks. He did, and death and crossed over, and he did for you and me. What a message is there, my beloved. Now, if you will notice verse 19, the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spoke unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. Certainly, if you carry the spiritual lesson on out as it is here, what you do would be to teach your children the gospel. That's the business, I think, of parents, to give the children the gospel. And there's no privilege like the privilege that a parent has of leading a child to a saving knowledge of Christ. My wife had the privilege of leading our daughter to the Lord. I did not. She was the one, and we believe that parents are the ones to do that. Now, will you notice, then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. And he did it for your benefit and mine, for the people of the earth. There's a message here for you and me today, and it's a very wonderful message, by the way. Now we are with the children of Israel on the west bank of the Jordan. They've crossed over into the land. Now, there are several things that they did here that we want to note. It's quite possible we might pass over this. We have here, they performed the rite of circumcision, and then the manna ceased, and they began to eat the old corn of the land. And then there was the unseen captain, and Joshua needed this vision at this time. These are the three things that 
are very prominent here. Now let's notice this because I think this is very important to see. It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. You see, they never thought they would cross over at this time. It would have to be after the flood season was over. The latter rains were at this time. Now will you notice verse 2. At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. And why was it performed at this time? Well, all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now, all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. In other words, Israel neglected this rite, which was the badge of the Abrahamic covenant. And that covenant, you remember, said that God was to give them the land, you see. They had neglected this, apparently, in the land of Egypt, because we're told here that the reproach of Egypt is to be rolled away. Now, we are told, verse 6, for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land, which the Lord sware unto their fathers, that he would give us a land that flowed with milk and honey. And their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, For they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. That is, it's a rolling away. Gilgal means to roll. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. You see, it was the spring of the year, the time of the latter rains that this was done. And now they have performed this rite which had been neglected. The reproach of Egypt was that these people had left off this very important rite which was the badge of the Abrahamic covenant. The fact of the matter is that God had promised Abraham to give him that land. Now it has a spiritual message for us today, and that means very candidly that the old nature is no good, and the old nature can never inherit the spiritual blessings. In fact, the old nature can enjoy the spiritual blessings, as we shall see. The old nature won't like Canaan by any means and doesn't like entering into the heavenlies. And there's that constant war. After Paul gave the sixth of Romans, he gave the seventh of Romans when there was a war between the old nature and the new nature. And in Galatians, he says, For the spirit warreth against the flesh, and the flesh warreth against the spirit. Now, there's no good in the old nature. Paul said that, that he found that there was no good in the old nature. But he also discovered that there's no power in the new nature. That is one of the great lessons that Paul taught us, that there's no power in that new nature. Therefore, they are to be circumcised to recognize that. Now, who's going to give them the victory in the land? Well, God's going to give them the victory. And they must be prepared for that. Now we'll see as we move along. Now we come to something else that was preparation for them entering the land. 
verse 11, they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. The picture is just simply this. Manna was the picture out there in the wilderness of Christ, as we've said. You remember that they came to the Lord Jesus about that same thing over in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. You remember I dwelt on that quite a bit when we were in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. And we saw at that particular time that Christ was that manna. It's so indicated. This is the thing the Lord Jesus said now. He says in John 6, 49, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they're dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I shall give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, the important thing to see is manna represents Christ and his death. It represents that he's the one that came down to give his life a ransom for many. And that manna is very important, by the way. That's the bread. But here's old corn. The manna seeds. Now, there are a great many people today, and I want you to hear me now very carefully. There are a great many people today that live on testimonies. Now, there are banquet after banquet, church banquets, Christian organization banquets. And they always have somebody to give a testimony. Well, now, fine, that's good. A testimony is wonderful to give to unsaved people. But my friend, when Christians, all they do is live on testimonies, what are they living on? They're living on manna. They love that. It's exciting food. It's wonderful food. But my friend, if you ever enter into Canaan and lay hold of spiritual blessings, you're going to stop eating manna, and you're going to start eating the old corn. You know what the old corn is? It's the Word of God. (laughs) All the way from Genesis to Revelation, 66 books, all of it is the Word of God. And that's old corn. That's what I'm dishing out, old corn. A friend of mine who heard me say that said, yes, he said, the jokes you tell are really old corn. I'll agree with that. Well, friends, very frankly, they are. But the old corn is really the Word of God. And there are a great many people don't like old corn. The children of Israel, they complained about manna. But it really was exciting food. Oh, it was exciting. And you remember we mentioned the fact that Miss Moses, nothing said about her in particular, but I think maybe she got out a cookbook. Mother Moses' cookbook about how to fix manna. You could fix it about a hundred different ways. It was pretty exciting food. Now, when it got in the land, it's old corn. <laughs> they got tired of that. Let me tell you, old corn, it gets pretty monotonous, especially if you've been eating manna all along. And a great many people today really are not interested in Bible study. I have discovered that it doesn't take them long to get away from Bible teaching. I've seen pastors of churches who've been great Bible teachers, and the Lord's blessed their ministry and teaching the Word of God. People say, my, that church is sure anchored to the Word of God. Is it? Well, I'll tell you what I've seen in several instances. I've seen that pastor leave, and just like Moses that had gone up to the mountain, he's gone, and the people say, well... Our Bible teacher is gone, so let's make us a golden calf. And they start dancing around it. And they start having their church banquets, and they put in new methods and new programs. And what happens? They get away from the Word of God. May I say to you, old corn's not as exciting as it could be. But God wanted them to have old corn now and let the manna alone. He's not going to feed them with that any longer. And friends, if you're just living on manna today, you'll never grow up. It'll sustain you in the wilderness. But if you're going to enter into your spiritual blessings, you'll have to start eating the old corn. Many of us need to change our diet today. Then we come to verse 13, came to pass when Joshua 
was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but is the captain of the host of the Lord. Am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now this really is the call of Joshua and his commission is right here. And it's the same as Moses got out on the plain of Midian when the bush appeared that burned and he was told to take off his shoe. Now, I think this man Joshua walked out one morning after they crossed the Jordan River and he looked over the scenery. And I want to tell you, it was impressive. There was the camps of all the 12 tribes all around him. And he looked at it and I think he swelled with a little pride. I'm not sure but what he was like a second lieutenant. My, I tell you, he was one that was in charge of that. And he's the one. And GHQ's in his tent now. He's the leader of this great group. And he is the follower of Moses. He must have felt pretty good. Then he happened to look down at the edge of the camp and he saw one with a drawn sword. You know who that was? I believe that was none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. He's the captain of our salvation. He was the captain. And Joshua, he looked at this one and he said, you know, there's somebody down there that doesn't know that I'm the general here. And I never gave a command for anybody to draw a sword. I better go down there and put that fellow in his place. Let him know who's the general here. So he walked down there and, well, our translation says, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Now, if you want it in good old Americana, here's what he says. What's the big idea? <laughs> What's the big idea? Who gave you an order to draw a sword? And then that one turned. And when he turned, he's the pre-incarnate Christ. He says, I'm the captain of the house of the Lord. And when Joshua saw him, what happened to him? Well, he fell on his face before him. And you know what Joshua found out? Joshua found out that GHQ wasn't in his tent. It was up yonder. It was at the throne of God. And God was leading him. And he found out he actually was not the captain of the hosts of the Lord. That he was under someone else. And he'd be taking his orders from someone else. And that he would obey him. And you know, the thing about a soldier is he's to obey the command, those that are above him, the brass. I tell you, he bows before the brass and he salutes it. And that's what Joshua's learned now to do. Now, I haven't any problem with Joshua when I find him marching around the city of Jericho, which we'll see next time. He went around it seven straight days and on the seventh day seven times. I want to tell you one thing. That was a pretty foolish thing to do, as we're going to see. Now, if you had stopped Joshua on the sixth day and said, Look, Brother Joshua, or General Joshua, this is a pretty silly thing. He says, You know, that's what I think. Then why are you doing it? You're in command here. He said, You're wrong. I take my orders in another place. There's someone above me. I just happen to be a buck private in the rear ranks. And I'm taking orders there. And the orders have come from above that I'm to do this. And you know, it's not my business to question. I'm doing it because I've been commanded to do it. And you know, a buck private doesn't walk into where the general is and say, now look, general, I got a better idea to carry on this campaign than you've come up with. Do you mind if I tell you about it? What do you think would happen to that buck private? My friends, he just wouldn't be listened to, that's all. I think he'd find himself in the brig, in the guardhouse. Now, let me tell you, Joshua is going to march around the city of Jericho. Now, you can laugh at him if you want to, but you better talk to his general. He's the one that had charge. Until next time, may God richly bless you. Download your free copy of Briefing the Bible. In it, you'll find Dr. Begee's notes and outlines for our study in Joshua at ttb.org. And remember, you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll put an abbreviated paperback copy in the mail to you for free.
Now, should the church actively fight against the evils of this world? What do you think? Well, why don't you join us next time for Dr. McGee's Surprising Answer. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.